Welcome to the Procurement Software Podcast, where we aim to educate and inspire you about how technology is changing and shaping our profession. The truth is, there's never been a more exciting time to be in procurement, but only if you're one of those organizations that's embracing the change and driving new developments. And this podcast is all about giving you the tools to help you get there. So buckle up and let's get right into this week's show. Yes, welcome to the Procurement Software Podcast. Great to have you with us. We are the official podcast of procurementsoftware.site, where you can search, filter, and select procurement technology that matches your individual search criteria completely free of charge. And we have over 440 solutions now listed in our database. Just go to app.procurementsoftware.site and you can search for whichever type of main category of software it is you're looking for completely for free on the front end. Anyway, today's podcast is going to take a look at an article actually that a former colleague of mine sent me asking really for my opinion on it. And it's a really interesting one because it indicates that there's a lot of tension out there in terms of ease of use of software and adaptability of software and getting people within large organizations to use these software platforms that are being pushed down onto them. So I'm not going to beat around the bush anymore, and I'm going to jump straight in there. And it's an article that was taken from The Guardian, and it's a bit of an editorial piece, and it's called Your Office Software is Not the Problem, You Are. And In general, the take of the article is saying that people should stop moaning about office software or corporate software that they're being forced to use at work, uh, about it being clunky and not user-friendly and difficult to use, and instead take an inward look at themselves and adapt to the environment that they're in. And they're saying that it's not the software provider's fault that organizations don't know how to implement and deploy their software. Now, this article specifically was referring to Workday. Workday, as I guess some of you know, originally started out as being an HR software. And then over time, they bought a number of different other software companies to really sort of hash together, get an alternative to some of the major ERP platforms. They indeed bought a startup called Scout RFP in the sourcing space. And that was integrated into Workday's software. So as they have a strategic sourcing module as part of their platform. But whether it refers to Workday or whether it refers to one of the more famous examples in the procurement technology space of legacy software that's not particularly user-friendly, I'm going to sort of apply more general principles here in terms of my critique on this article. So my former colleague, Claire, who messaged me uh, with this article and asked me for my opinion, actually, I think the article is complete rubbish in terms of what it's saying. You know, if it's saying essentially it's the individual worker's fault that they're not able to use the software. But in fairness to where the article is coming from, It's trying to explain that part of the problem within any software implementation and any software rollout is partly to do with the mindset of the individual, but also to do with the communication and the planning and the execution uh, of the software implementation. And a lot of big corporate software does require a certain degree or a large degree in many cases of customization to be able to get it to do what you want it to do. So I'm certainly not saying that it's the software's fault entirely, you know, especially when we look at resistance to change in organizations. Mindset especially is a huge barrier when it comes to employees being able to accept and embrace change. I'm sure if any of you listening to this are team leaders or department leaders, you've probably got one or two people in your team that don't like change and and tend to resist it at any given opportunity. But 
And this is where I have a gripe with the article and with the author. You can have the most open-minded attitude in the workplace, but you can still be saddled with clunky software that's very difficult to use and just an in inadequate rollout and training materials to be able to assist you towards being able to understand it. And well, is that the software company's fault? Well, no, not really. I mean, poor UI and UX is certainly the software company's fault. So if a software company has developed a platform that is fundamentally unintuitive to use, then the blame for that rests solely on the shoulders of the company's product developers and user experience team. So that part most definitely is nothing that the end user can change. And I would almost go, to, go as far to say as that, that there are intuitive and easy to use software platforms that also do exactly the same functions as some of these legacy, more confusing, not user-friendly software suite. And oftentimes these choices, these new best of breed startups are much cheaper too, because not only are they built on the latest technology, you're dealing with a startup rather than a huge bloated corporate software behemoth. And you know, if we're used to having great user experience in some of the apps that we use on our smartphone or that we use in day-to-day -day life, things like booking flights or hotels or online grocery shopping, for example, then why should we have to roll back the clock, turn back the clock 20 years when we come into the workplace? Surely business-to-business -business software with the money that's sloshing around in there should be able to get this right. And yes, you know, an enterprise software application is going to be a lot more complex than an e-commerce store. I get that. But if we're used to having great beta, great UX in, in mobile phone apps or in websites that we use as a consumer, then my expectation is when I go into the workplace and certainly, you know, a millennial or a Gen Z, especially who have grown up as digital natives, they're going to demand the software is easy to use. And if you're forcing them to use a front end in something like SAP or Oracle, that's a nightmare to use. And it looks horrible. It looks like it's from the 1990s because it was, or it is. Then you're going to struggle. Part of this also rests on the software provider in terms of how they train their salespeople too. If their salespeople are going out promising that the software can be everything to everybody, and if they're not entirely honest around the degree of customization that a software platform needs, or the amount of external IT consultancy and the amount of time that you need to be able to implement it and get it working properly, then they should really be honest about that. You know, they need to tell the user that it's not something that you can plug and play, or even in a lot of cases have up and running in, in a couple of months if you're looking at one of the big enterprise software suites. So I think that's down to the software solution provider as well. So user experience and how they train their salespeople in terms of the software and, and, and how much customization and IT consultancy it needs to get it working properly, that's definitely on the shoulders of the software solution provider. What's down to the actual organization that's implementing the software? Because it takes two to tango, right? And it can't all be the software provider's fault. So this is where it comes down to poor communication and just a lack of adequate onboarding and training when it comes to rolling this software out within an organization. And I will differentiate a little bit here between something that is very stakeholder focused or supplier focused, like source to pay software, which requires a high level of user adoption. That's definitely where you really need to be on cue with your training and your internal communication and your onboarding. Whereas if it's something that primarily is only going to be used by procurement, 
you know, maybe finance or legal if we're talking about spend analytics or contract management software. That's going to have much fewer casual, occasional users that need to go in there, both on the internal stakeholder side and on the supplier side. So I would say in those specific examples, rollout and onboarding and training and end user experience, even to a certain extent, is less critical than if it's a piece of software that requires mass adoption by the organization. So I will differentiate between those two. But anyway, I digress a little bit. Best software, the real best in class software that's out there shouldn't really need a lot of training. Let's get this clear. You know, if you need two weeks of intensive training and you need an army of super users to roll out your platform, that's not the end customer's fault. That's your fault for having built such a complex software solution. But if we put that to one side, even the most intuitive software needs some training and some rollout process, and it has to be done properly. What do I mean by that? Well, doesn't solve the problem if you just send out a blanket email to the whole Outlook email directory in your organization with a link to a SharePoint site that hold, that has a few PDF documents in terms of user manuals of how to use the software. Number one, if people are getting 100 emails a day, nobody's going to read your email. Probably just goes straight in the, on the delete button if someone sees that. Number two, if you're in procurement or center of excellence or whatever role it is rolling out this software platform, the onus is on you to educate the end user and make it as easy as possible for them to learn how to use that software. Just putting a SharePoint site together or doing some half at one-hour training session at certain fixed times that not everyone in every single time zone can join, that's not really very customer-centric in your attitude and the way that you're rolling that out. What you really need to do is engage with the user. So create something like drop-in or clinic sessions at their different sites or on their different time zones if you're a primarily remote-first company. Do some podcasts or do some explainer videos so as people that prefer to consume content in an audio or a visual manner will also get to see what essentially you've put into your written documents as well. You need to explain the why. You know, why are we rolling out this software? What does it do? And then you also need to explain how you're rolling it out and how the user can become functional enough in that software to be able to, to, to adopt it and use it and for it to not slow them down in their working day. So that really needs to be in bite-sized pieces to enable them to be able to consume that in small pieces. So think maybe three or four minute videos or, or short podcast episodes, or if you've got access to a graphic designer, maybe through your marketing team, work with a graphic designer to put together some infographics to be able to explain the salient points in a visually pleasing, easy to read manner. Bear in mind also that you're going to have users that perhaps are not native English speakers, if, you know, especially if you work for a multinational company. So if all of your documentation is in English, that's another barrier for them to be able to use and adopt and really embrace the software that you're trying to roll out onto them. So there is, of course, a certain onus on the way that that's rolled out and the project management team that's tasked with doing that. So on that topic as well of, you know, the execution and the rollout and the team that's doing it, I would also appeal to all procurement, heads of procurement or center of excellence leaders out there that, that are tasked with doing this. Don't just dump this onto another overworked category manager and sell it to them as a development opportunity and expect everything to go swimmingly well. I'm sorry, but that's just bad management. You need to be assertive as a leader when talking to your CFO or your budget holder if you need specialist resources to make this a success. 
digital transformation and rollout of digital procurement software can add so much value to the business in terms of savings on administrative busy work or improvements to data, visibility of spend, all that type of all, all, all those types of soft benefits and hard benefits as well. It really should be seen as an investment rather than a cost. So if you're a leader, then you need to lead and you need to be more assertive to make sure that you get enough budget and enough resource around you to be able to put intuitive training materials together and to be able to have the resource to be able to roll it out and educate your users properly. Because if someone's just managing this as an extra task on top of their day job, don't blame them when it fails. It's your fault for not really seeing that as a manager and being able to approach it as an investment rather than a cost. So in summary, where while this article in The Guardian is saying, you know, these software solutions are usually big, complicated systems, and I'm quoting them here, it says, like any big, complicated system, it requires big, complicated grown-ups to run it. Yes, it does. It's not the end user's fault if the software doesn't get, doesn't get accepted, doesn't get adopted. So I would not blame the end user. Instead, I would look at the software that you're choosing and make sure that user experience and ease of implementation are some of the top criteria in terms of how you weight the different responses that you get when you're doing an, when you're doing an RFP or when you're doing an inquiry for different, for different software solutions to implement. But also that you make sure that you invest the necessary time and resources and think outside the box when you come to the whole change management and implementation and adoption and communication piece. There will always be a few people that will stubbornly resist change. And in that case, I would definitely agree with the article when it says that you're the problem and not the software. But the vast majority, certainly from my own personal experience, of people within an organization will embrace software if it's easy to use and that they're shown in a simple, easy to digest way how they can use it. And this, I think, is where software companies and project leaders or project sponsors really need to up their game to ensure that the software that's been implemented is fit for purpose and that the implementation and execution of that IT project is done in a professional way with the right amount of resources and the most effective means of communication. And hey, if you need a little bit of help in terms of being able to go to the complete breadth of the market that's out there in terms of potential software solutions. So as you know exactly who you should be including in your tenders for procurement technology, that is what I do. And I'm completely agnostic here because I don't do software implementation. So I have no skin in the game to offer you a, a difficult, complex software to implement because I'm making a bunch of money on time and materials during the implementation. Because I only do help with the sourcing piece and this more up, upstream RFI as a service type of piece to be able to help you understand which providers on the market you should shortlist when you go out and do your request for a proposal or your request for solution. This is where I feel I could offer you a unique service there in a completely unbiased manner and get you to where you need to get to without you having to spend a lot of money on an external consultant. You can hire me as a subject matter expertise to do that upstream piece of work together. And I will get you there a lot faster than having your own team bumbling around in Google trying to figure out which technology providers should you be inviting. And even then, you're probably going to miss out on one or two that are real cutting edge, innovative players that we've got listed on the website and we know exist, but you and your organization perhaps don't. So. That's my deep dive into this article that, that caught my eye after I was sent it and really just wanted to share my thoughts on where I think the needs to be improvement from both the software solution providers and the software sourcing and implementation team to ensure that any procurement tech implementation goes as planned. That's all for today. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast, then please subscribe or follow where you listen to your podcasts. And if you can as well, 
please give us a review because it does help us to reach more people and appear at uh, the higher end of the rankings when you search Procurement Podcasts on your favorite podcast apps. We'll be back same time again next week. Do take care wherever you are in the world. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.